Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Overcoming Challenges in the Cellular Therapy Laboratory. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Terumo BCT. Terumo BCT is a global leader in blood component, therapeutic apheresis, and cellular technologies. It is the only company with a unique combination of apheresis collections, manual and automated whole blood processing, and pathogen reduction technologies. Terumo BCT believes in the potential of blood to do even more for patients than it does today. This belief inspires the company's innovation and strengthens its collaboration with customers. To learn more about Terumo BCT, please visit www.terumobct.com. So let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speaker, Patrick Hanley, PhD. Dr. Hanley is the Laboratory Facility Director and an Assistant Professor at Children's National Health System and George Washington University. He oversees the Class 10,000 GMP facility at Children's National, which is charged with manufacturing novel cellular therapies in the Program for Cell Enhancement and Technology for Immunotherapy, SECI, under IND applications and processing standard of care stem cell transplant products. Dr. Hanley is also responsible for follow-up and immune reconstitution testing performed on patients treated on SETI's protocols. He has been involved in more than 15 clinical trials in the past 10 years. Dr. Hanley has been recognized as a developing expert in the field of cellular therapy and cellular therapy product manufacturing. He was granted the Excellence in Research Award by the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy in 2012 and the Young Investigator Award by the International Society for Cell Therapy in 2013 and 2016. In 2017, he was awarded the Be the Match American Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation Amy Strelzer Manasevit Award. Dr. Hanley is passionate about developing dedicated training programs for cellular therapists, particularly programs dedicated to training scientists in positions within the cellular therapy laboratory. His complete bio is found on the Labrits website. Dr. Hanley will now begin his presentation. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present my talk today titled Overcoming Challenges in the Cellular Therapy Laboratory. My name is Patrick Hanley, and again, I'm the laboratory director at Children's National Hospital. Before we begin, I do want to disclose that I have a disclosure. I am a co-founder and vice president of Monotherapeutics, and I hold equity in Monotherapeutics, which is a new startup company that generates tumor-specific T cells targeting AML that are not genetically modified. So to provide the foundation for my talk today, I wanted to use bone marrow transplant as a model for cellular therapies. So bone marrow transplant is the treatment of choice for many hematologic malignancies, as well as some genetic disorders. Unfortunately, the necessary myeloblative regimen uh, and conditioning for these transplants really, uh, leave the patient susceptible to viral infections, as well as relapse, and also graft host disease. So I wanted to use bone marrow transplant as a model to develop therapies to treat these different complications. So again, those are viral infection, relapse in the case of patients that have cancer, and also graft versus host disease where the graft attacks the, the recipient. So the way that we target these complications is by using tumor-specific T cells, virus-specific T cells, and mesenchymal stromal cells. So to begin, I'll talk about the virus-specific T cells. And these have been developed by um, Anne Lean, uh, Cleo Rooney, Helen Heslop, and others at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and it's to the point now where we can actually just take 
peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So we'll take about uh, 15 or 20 milliliters of peripheral blood, isolate the PBMCs, and uh, expose those PBMCs to overlapping viral peptides derived from the viruses of interest. In this case, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and adenovirus, because those are the three greatest viral complications after transplant, at least in our experience. So once those PBMCs are exposed to the peptides, we also add the growth factors interleukin-4 and interleukin-7. And after about 10 days, we're able to harvest the virus-specific T cells. These T cells, of course, undergo sterility testing, testing for mycoplasma, endotoxin, L reactivity, um, viability, as well as HLA to ensure that the identity of those cells is, um, is concordant with the original cells that we started with. And this is what you would expect to see when you give virus civic T cells based on the, the last 25 years of data. So shown in red is the viral load of a patient um, who had an EBV infection. You can see that this patient was treated with rituximab and they did not respond. So we decided to give them EBV specific T cells that are part of that virus civic T cells uh, line I just talked about. You see in red, there's an increase in the EBV specific T cells. We give the T cells and there's a, a quick decline in the viral load of EBV in the peripheral blood of this patient. When we, taste the, when we test the peripheral blood of the patient for EBV, EBV specific T cells, shown in blue, you can see that there's a coinciding increase in the number of EBV specific T cells in that patient. And again, this is the, the hallmark of, of what we'd expect to see um, if we're going to see a, a, a virus specific T cell response. So again, this patient, this protocol is here at Children's National. We've treated 22 patients. The response rate is greater than 80%. Um, most patients that come to us had refractory disease with few other options. In fact, I, I'd say that we get about two referrals a week for patients who have refractory viral infection post-transplant, and they don't have many other options, and so they come asking if uh, we have a protocol open to give these patients virus-specific T cells. So now we're planning to open, and we have opened, a new protocol called NATS, um, where we target BK virus, HHV6, and parainfluenza, and that's in addition to the CMV, EBV, and adovirus that we had targeted before. So these are now hexavirus-specific T cells. So that's great if you have a donor of the bone marrow transplant that you can go to, get the, make the cells from, and treat the recipient. But what if you don't have the donor? What if it's a cord blood transplant, and you have a patient that has reactivation of CMV? How can you proceed? Are there T cells that we can use? And the answer is yes. So we can use third-party T cells. What we can do is we can take those cells that we originally made in the first protocol I told you about and bank them. So now we have a bank of something like 42 different EBV, CMV, and adenovirus civic T cell lines that we can choose from based on the HLA of the recipient as well as the virus specific activity of those lines through those shared alleles, those HLA alleles. So we have a third-party T cell protocol open here at Children's National. Um, that's open to recipients of a bone marrow transplant 30 days after the transplant. We treated 12 patients on this study, and the overall response rate is 72%, so not altogether different than the donor-derived cells that we mentioned earlier. And, it, and of importance, these cells are potentially available immediately. So if we were to get a referral um, today, we could theoretically treat the patient tomorrow or the next day, depending on the location of that, that recipient. And if we, again, look at that hallmark of a virus to a T cell response, you can see here uh, the viral load of this patient. In this, patient, in this instance, the patient had adenovirus. Um, that is shown in red. Shortly after the T cell infusion, we're able to detect adenovirus to T cells in the peripheral blood of that patient, and these are both shown in blue. Hexon and penton are both proteins derived of adenovirus. So I've shown you that we can generate T cells that target um, viruses, and we can actually use third-party T cells targeting viruses. So it seems like we have some options to combat or tr treat or prevent viral infections post-transplant. But what about patients who are coming to transplant because of leukemia or other um, malignancies? Well, we're now generating tumor-specific T cells um, as another option. So to generate these T cells, we use a similar protocol to the virus-specific T cells, but it's a bit more complicated. And you can imagine um, the virus specific T cells, um, the majority of those donors have memory T cells that we can easily expand 
um, in the presence of those viral antigens. However, tumor-specific T cells we've shown actually come from the naive population of T cells, so they require priming and additional stimulations beyond just the one stimulation um, in the case of the virus T cells. And so what that looks like is shown here. Uh, we take peripheral blood from the transplant donor. We take probably upwards of 100 milliliters, 120 milliliters in one or two blood draws. From those peripheral blood mononuclear cells, we uh, generate mono, uh, mononuclears, uh, excuse me, uh, monocytes and dendritic cells from the adherent fraction. So we just put the PBNCs onto plastic, they adhere, we give them some GMCSF and IL-4, and they'll form dendritic cells. We harvest the non-adherent cells, which contains your T cells, and we freeze those back um, for when we need them during the T cell stimulation. So after seven days of dendritic cell uh, generation, we pulse those dendritic cells with the leukemia antigens or tumor-associated antigens made, excuse me, PRAME, WT1, and Survivin. So there's three, three antigens that we target. So the dendritic cells are pulsed with those three antigens, and they're used to stimulate the T cells that come from that cryopreserved fraction that we talked about before. Concurrently, we also generate dendritic cells for a second round of stimulation. So uh, in seven days after that initial stimulation, we'll give a second stimulation with the dendritic cells pulsed with those same peptides. For the third stimulation, what we use are activated T cells, or PHA blasts. And so we'll pulse those same T cells, uh, those same, uh, we'll pulse the T cells with those same peptides um, for the third simulation. So after about 30 days, uh, we've generated tumor-specific T cells. And so these are the interim results of this study. So this study was open to uh, both pediatric and adult patients, um, many of whom had received a haploidentical transplant. I think we were, we were all surprised to see that of the 10 evaluable patients, 50 of them had a complete response, including four patients with AML, which um, you, you don't typically see. So um, the recently approved Novartis CAR T cell, for example, is targeted at ALL, not AML. So here we have a different option. 20% um, of those patients had um, uh, persistent disease, and 20% of them had stable disease, or excuse me, progressive disease. Um, and 10 had um, mineral residual disease, excuse me, mixed response. Um, it's important to point out that the prognosis of these patients was not good. So all these patients had failed a bone marrow transplant at least once, many of them many times, um, and they were all extremely high risk. We would not expect the life expectancy of these patients to be very long, um, and um, to see that there's, many of them are still alive today is is, is really encouraging. So I've shown you that we have virus-specific T cells, we have tumor-specific T cells, but what about graft-versus-host disease? How can we treat graft-versus-host disease? So one way to treat graft-versus-host disease, and this is nothing new, uh, many studies have been done using MSCs, um, but one option is to use the MSCs. So they're adherent, non-hematopoietic, multipotent stem cells, or, or stromal cells, that differentiate into chondroblasts, adipocytes, and osteoblasts. So one unique property of these MSCs is that they don't express HLA class II molecules or, co or co co-stimulatory molecules. So they, we can use banked MSCs, um, and they would persist long enough to potentially deliver a clinical benefit. Um, so e each recipient would not need their own MSC donor. What makes MSCs particularly appealing in the graft versus host disease setting is that they're both immunosuppressive and regenerative. So they can uh, suppress the immune response or, or the, the graft versus host disease and also help repair any damage that was already done. But of course, manufacturing MSCs is quite challenging. So what you see on the right uh, is a former staff member of mine at Baylor College of Medicine, um, where, and she's preparing to harvest 200 flasks to make the MSCs. Um, so that's an entire double stack of incubators full of flasks with MSCs. Um, it's labor intensive, there's a limited culture life, so you want to reduce the number of passages of these MSCs, um, but that's a bit of a conundrum because you need to pass it in multiple times in order to reach your cell dose. And this is what that manufacturing paradigm looks like in a cartoon fashion. So you would start with, say, four flasks and end up with um, many hundreds of flasks. So we set out to improve this manufacturing process, and it was a, a nice partnership with Terumo, um, where we were able to generate 
these MSCs using the cell, quantum cell expansion system. So this is a mostly automated system with 2.1 square meters of surface area, which is about 120 T175 glass. It has the optimal exchange of gas and nutrients, and it's functionally closed. So um, theoretically, you could put multiple quantums in one room um, and generate different lots of MSCs, of course, given regulatory approval. Um, what I really like about the quantum is that it has a rapid harvest time. So you can imagine harvesting 300 T175 flasks would take you probably um, five or six hours with five people. The harvest in the quantum is at most 45 minutes, and it's a touch of a button. And this is what the quantum looks like inside. So you have a bioreactor, which is shown at the bottom. I like to say that that's a, a Pringles can. So that Pringles can is then full of straws, or the, the hollow fiber bioreactors. The straws are what's shown at the top, and that's where the MSCs grow. So they grow inside of each one of the straws, and there's about 10,000 of those straws, again, the hollow, fiber, hollow fibers, inside of the bioreactor. And that's how you get that large surface area. And this is what a manufacturing paradigm would look like at least a couple of years ago when we published this paper. So you would coat the quantum with fibronectin. You would then load in your bone marrow into the quantum. Um, after one passage, you would load in triple select or whatever your dissociation reagent is. Uh, you would harvest the MSCs. So we would harvest somewhere around 50 million MSCs. Uh, you could then coat the, the bioreactor with fibronectin for four hours and then reload about 20 million of those MSCs. Um, and depending on, on whatever media you're using and growth factors and things like that, and of course the donor, um, you could harvest as many as 600 million MSCs. And again, this was, this was about three or four years ago. So the question we asked was actually not in graft versus host disease, but it was a, a partnership with someone uh, in Houston where we wanted to manufacture these cells for ischemic stroke. And so we said, okay, well, we can grow two to three million MSCs per flask. And so, you know, this was in Texas where everything is uh, bigger and arguably better. Um, so we would need about 500 million MSCs for each patient. And that's about 200 T175 flasks. So, what we're trying to show here is even if we use FLAS, this is a, a feasible approach to manufacture these MSCs for this trial. We wanted to improve on that. We didn't want to spend the five hours and five people harvesting the MSCs. So we said, well, can we use the quantum? And so we tested various lots of MSCs in both flasks and the quantum. And what this slide here shows is that we were able to generate more MSCs faster in the quantum than in flasks. So in black is in the quantum and in grays and flasks, and at this time we were able to generate um, a median or a mean of uh, 600 or 700 million MSCs after only two passages, whereas in the quantum we needed three to five to get half that number. When you look at MSCs, you typically define them by their phenotype as well as their trilineage potential, and so here we looked at the, the hallmark the phenotype of MSCs, including CD105, CD90, and CD73, and you can see here that the viability in both MSCs, in both flasks and the quantum, was quite similar. One of the questions we asked as well is the doubling time difference. So why is the quantum allowing for more cells quicker than flasks? Is it because the cells are doubling faster or fewer cells are dying or what is the answer? And um, the answer seems to be that the cells in, in quantum have a similar doubling time than in flasks. Um, but perhaps it's slightly higher. We also tested the MSCs for colony forming units, which is another uh, characteristic of MSCs, um, and we did see a trend towards higher um, CFUs in the quantum. Importantly, we analyzed the function of these MSCs. So there's many different ways to analyze the function of MSCs, and oftentimes it depends on what your downstream application is. So if you're looking at some sort of regenerative medicine potential, maybe you need to do um, the trilineage potential. Um, you know, if you're looking at bone, then you do the osteogenic potential. So we were interested in the immunosuppressive capabilities of the MSCs. So we set up a, an assay uh, with some of our collaborators through PACT, where we analyzed the ability of the T cells to suppress T cell proliferation. And you can see here that the MSCs grown in both flasks and the quantum seem to equally or similarly um, inhibit the proliferation of the T cells. And of course, perhaps the most important functional test of these MSCs is an in vivo model. So 
these we wanted this application was for ischemic stroke, and so we tested these MSCs in a model of ischemic stroke in rats, and so that's shown here. We tested quantum derived MSCs, plasterized MSCs, as well as a, a saline, and what you can see is that the therapeutic benefit of the MSCs grown in quantum was better than in flasks and just saline alone. And I mentioned earlier that what I was showing the data was from 2014. Well, here's what that looks like today. So we've made some improvements in our MSC generation, and here's what it looks like. So sometimes we have to start for using flasks for the first or second passage due to the amount of bone marrow that we can get from, um, it's the leftover bone marrow from transplant donors. Um, but nevertheless, we can load bone marrow into the quantum for passage one. We'll get about 25 to 55 million cells. And for passage two, we'll reload about 20 million cells and recover 800 million cells. We then reload 20 million cells again for passage three, and we recover 1.1 billion cells. Um, so you can imagine that we're able to build quite a sizable bank using just one lot of bone marrow. So here's where we are today. We can manufacture donor-derived virus specific T cells to prevent or treat viral infection, and those cells seem to be quite effective. We can deliver third-party virus specific T cells with a similar efficacy um, and almost immediately. We can also manufacture tumor-associated antigen specific T cells, and these have an overall response rate of 75%, um, again, which is, we were quite surprised by, with a complete response rate of 50%. And this is not altogether different than the response rates you see with the chimeric antigen receptors that have already been approved by the FDA. Um, and we're looking to pursue that now. Lastly, we can manufacture MSCs for various indications, including graft-versus-host disease, as well as ischemic stroke. But manufacturing these cells is still not easy. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of people. And so there's still a few challenges that we need to overcome. So how do we move beyond transplant? How do we afford to make all these products? If we're making three products for every uh, recipient of a bone marrow transplant, that's going to be pretty expensive. You saw the cost of the cars at $375,000 or $475,000. Um, you can imagine that a similar cost for three products. It would be upwards of a million dollars. And how do we make three products for patient? Um, you can imagine the space that would be required. So how do we move beyond transplant? Well, one option is actually to use the tumor-associated antigen T cells I talked about, but for solid tumors instead of leukemia post-transplant. And that's something we are pursuing. We're also looking at using those T cells before a transplant to get the patient into remission and then keep them into remission. You might have heard that CAR T cells are, are being looked at in the same fashion to use them as a bridge for transplant, and that's an option for these T cells as well. Um, we are also generating HIV-specific T cells. Um, targeting GAG, Paul, and NEF for HIV-positive recipients and I think our HIV-positive patients, and I think that's encouraging. Um, we're using MSCs for inflammatory bowel disease and, of course, chimeric antigen receptors, which we've talked about a bit before. So one challenge is how can we afford to make these products? So much of this work that's been happening for 25 years in the case of the virus T cells is no longer innovative. So you know, if you, you apply for a grant, you say, look, I need these cells because we need to treat, treat the recipients. Um, you know, the reviewers will say, well, this has been around for 25 years, what's different? Um, but the conundrum we have is that we get referrals each week from patients or from physicians across the country who say, I have this patient, they are, they're failing gancyclovir, they're failed phoscarnet, we don't have any other options, can you enroll them on your trial? So we're literally treating these patients at a cost to our center um, because we care about the well-being of these patients. Um, so the cost of these, of these therapies is prohibitive, but we still need to find a mechanism to treat these patients who, who need these options. So some um, companies have now started to use these antiviral T cells, Atara, for example, um, Virocyte, and so it is encouraging that they might have options, but we still need to find a way uh, to afford these, pro these products. One option for companies uh, or for institutions is cost recovery. So this is actually a thing. Uh, the FDA has sanctioned cost recovery if there are extraordinary costs associated with manufacturing the products. Um, but it's important to recognize that these are only the direct costs associated with manufacturing the products. 
and not the cost of tracking the patient and things like that. So it is limited. Um, also, the FDA doesn't tell you how to recover those funds. So you'll have to work with your hospital to find a mechanism to either get the insurance company to reimburse or perhaps another hospital. Another option is to convince your hospital that it's cheaper or drives revenue elsewhere. Uh, this is potentially easier in Europe, um, but it also is an option in the United States. So if you have a patient who has to come to get tumor-specific T-cells and maybe they have to have an inpatient stay, there's probably other costs associated with that stay that will drive revenue, um, especially if that patient were to receive a bone marrow transplant at that same institution. Another option is to make the products cheaper. So if, if, the, if the cells are allogeneic or banked, as we've discussed earlier, um, those cells will be cheaper than if you have to make a specific product, a personalized product, for every single recipient. So we are looking at that allogeneic model for T cells and for MSC. It's also important to educate physicians and the clinical staff as a whole about the cost of these products. So uh, a lot of these physicians have grown up in the environment that we've fostered where they have access to a lot of these innovative cell therapies, but they might not know of the cost of generating them or the time um, that staff have to, make, uh, have to take to make them. So we waste about 50% of our products because patients are enrolled who are unlikely to ever receive them. And this is a major product major problem for us. So um, staff in our facility spend a considerable amount of time, effort making these cells. And they do that, they work in, in, this, they work in this academic setting, not because they're trying to make a lot of money, but because they're really invested in healthcare, they want to improve the outcomes of the patients, and they're really excited by the innovative therapies that we offer. But if half of their products are never used, that really impacts their, their morale. And so there is room to educate the physicians about how to, how to only enroll patients who are likely to get these, these products. So how do we manufacture all these products? Well, one way is to build a massive GMP facility, which was not the case for us. So you can see here on the left, there's a small room. That is our ISO 7 facility that is dedicated solely to manufacturing IND products. The second room is an ISO 8 or class 100,000 facility used for stem cell processing. We will use the ISO 8 room in the case of overflow, and it does operate closer to ISO 6 than ISO 8. But nevertheless, we don't have a lot of manufacturing space, so we have to find creative ways to manufacture all these products given the space. We manufacture about 75 IND products a year and 75 stem cell products a year. Uh, we have about 100 infusions per year, and actually um, looking at our data, it's, it's probably closer to 125 or 150 now uh, because of the demand for these novel cell therapies that we're manufacturing. Um, what I think is really exciting is that we're embarking on multiple multi-center clinical trials. In fact, we were the first COG cell therapy study to ever be run. We were the manufacturing center for that, and that was a huge accomplishment for us. But you can imagine the amount of time and effort it took to get this up and running and to qualify all the sites. We're now looking to do a nationwide clinical trial using the biospecific T cells um, in, in collaboration with the um, Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Consortium. And so we're really excited about that trial as well, but it's going to take a lot of time and effort from staff. So adding a lot of these new protocols and cell types is a massive hurdle for us. So how do we manufacture all of them? Well, as I mentioned before, it's, in, it's important to educate the physician and physicians and pri prioritize the high-risk patients. So is this patient likely to get our therapy? If so, then yeah, absolutely. Let's enroll them, let's make those cells for them, and let's hope for the best. Um, another option is to stagger into shifts, working on weekends, and we're starting to do this. It's hard to justify more space when your space is only being used for a third of the time it could be utilized. Um, the next thing is to hire and retain um, fantastic and passionate staff. And this is definitely challenging giving, given the excitement and, and money being spent in the cell therapy arena. Um, but I'm very fortunate to have passionate, dedicated, staff who are really invested in, in manufacturing the products for the patients. They don't require a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of individual attention. They can handle um, a lot of the scheduling and things like that on their own. And so I'm really grateful for having such fantastic staff. And that's a key to being able to run a high-functioning facility. Um, but that's still not enough. I think what we really need is to improve the manufacturing methods. So one example is the tumor-associated antigen T-cells that I talked about. 
I'm really encouraged that the overall response rate is around 75% for these patients, that 50% of them have a complete response. But it takes one month to generate these T cells. Uh, it also takes two blood products. This process needs to be short. And if it can be automated, then that's all the better. I think my vision is to have 20 quantums, 20 prodigies, 20 waves, whatever it is, in one room, up, you know, generating 20 different lines simultaneously with a process that prevents contamination or mix-up, of course. That's an FDA regulation. Um, but it doesn't need 20 different clean rooms. And we need to, you know, that's the future of cell therapy. We need to be able to get there. Another option, or another example, is the virus T cells from cord blood. So it's my understanding that we're the first and only group to give virus T cells derived from cord blood, which is primarily naive T cells. But this process takes two or three months because it takes one to two months to generate the EBD LCL that are used to generate the T cells. So we came up with a method of using activated uh, PHA blasts or activated T cells instead of the LCL. And so we've shortened that process to 30 days. It's still not the 10 days it takes for the rapid T cells that we can make, but we're getting there. Another option is to automate. And so that goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where we have 20 different instruments manufacturing in parallel in one, one designated um, controlled airspace. And so that's where I'd like to go now. So I've shown you earlier that we can generate MSCs in the quantum. Um, I will say I, I'm not employed by Terumo. I don't, I don't get any royalties by Terumo. Uh, but I can unequivocally say that if we did not use the quantum, we would not have an MSC program here at Children's because we don't have the space or the personnel to manufacture um, 200 T175 flasks. And so I'm hoping to use that same uh, technology to grow T cells as well. So how would we be able to manufacture the CAR T cells in the quantum? Um, well, as I mentioned, the quantum is automated, it's self-contained, it has a small footprint, which is very attractive for that model I talked about earlier. We are comfortable using it. We use it for the MSCs, so we have knowledge of it. Uh, we already purchased the disposables for the MSCs, and Terumo does have an excellent training program um, that will help work with us to generate these T cells. Of course, we can generate 1 billion or more MSCs, so I would expect that we can probably generate 10 or 20 billion T cells given that T cells are considerably smaller than the MSCs. And so this was the, this was the design of our CAR T cell project. Um, we wanted to evaluate the expansion of mononuclear cell derived T cells in the quantum and in flasks, evaluate the transduction and expansion of the CAR T cells in quantum and flasks, and then evaluate the expansion of peripheral blood derived T cells in the quantum. So we just started this recently, so I don't have a lot of data to show, but I think it is promising. Um, these cells currently were expanded uh, from an apheresis product purchased by Key Biologics. We expanded them using Dynabeads in the presence of IL-2. The media was Tex-Max. We've since used, uh, switched to a um, RPMI and FBS-based model uh, due to cost and, and expansion potential. And this is what we were looking at. So we loaded 100 million um, mononuclear cells into the quantum, and after nine days, we were able to recover about six billion uh, T cells. So uh, you can see that that is a promising expansion. We've since optimized the protocol to get an even greater expansion in a shorter amount of time, which is very encouraging. When we, were, when we compared the flask to the quantum, um, these were using cryopreserved mononuclear cells. You can see that the expansion in the quantum is indeed greater than in flask. Uh, this is day 12 because the, the cells were cryopreserved, as I mentioned. So there, there does seem to be a lag phase in the cryopreserved uh, derived products versus the fresh derived products. And we're, st we're continuing to evaluate the expansion now um, and also evaluating the ability to transduce these T cells in the quantum. So in conclusion, cell therapies are promising but expensive and labor intensive um, uh, therapy, and they're also very sp space intensive. They're promising even beyond the transplant model, which is really encouraging for the field. Um, there are ways, definitely there are ways to increase efficiency and manufacturing capability um, through automation and creative thinking. I think we, we shouldn't be limited to um, only using qualified airspace um, for every single product. You know, there, there has to be a better way to manufacture these cells. And I think it will be a partnership with us, with industry, working with the FDA to find 
the, the most cost-effective way to do this. Um, and lastly, we're evaluating whether we can translate our knowledge from MSCs to grow T cells and CAR T cells in the quantum. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved uh, in this project. So our program director, Dr. Kath Bollard, has been incredibly supportive of all of these protocols um, since we started this new um, SETI program about four years ago here in D.C. Dr. Kirsten Williams is the PI of the tumor-specific T cell protocol, and she's been instrumental in really transforming that protocol and has kindly shared the data for me to present to you today. Dr. Mike Kella, Keller is the PI of the biospecific T cells, and he has also kindly supplied all that data and really taken that protocol um, and run with it. I'd like to thank FAMIDA, our, our regulatory director, as well as my incredible staff in the Cell Therapy Lab. I could not be more fortunate to have the staff that I do, um, and as well as Robert Ulrey has really uh, led the quantum T cell work. Lastly, I'd like to have a shameless plug. We are trying to, we are posting a postdoc position um, for someone to train to be a facility director. I should point out that I was fortunate enough to have a very similar situation when I was at Baylor College of Medicine. So I was able to generate biospecific T cells as a graduate student because I was so interested in it. I did a postdoc with Adrian G, um, who was our facility director on GMP regulations and just training on being a GMP director. After only two years, I was able to come to Children's National where I'm now the facility director here. And I'd like to replicate that same training um, position for someone. So if you know anyone, please e have them email me at phanley at childrensnational.org. I'm really committed to developing the next generation of cell therapists um, because I, I feel like there is really a shortage of knowledgeable staff to fill these, these positions. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to our organizers. Thank you, Dr. Hanley, for your presentation. Before we begin the question and answer session, I want to advise that a series of poll questions will appear on your screen during the Q&A. So you may select your answers, then close the poll questions by clicking on the X in the right corner. So here's a quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Hanley will answer as many questions as time permits. And the first question is, I see that you've been able to expand T cells in the quantum. Do you foresee any challenges or complications when trying to transduce T cells in the quantum or expand gene-modified cells in the quantum? That's a good question, and I think uh, if I was doing this on my own, I would, I would definitely be more concerned that it was not going to work just because of the, the sheer engineering that goes into the quantum and understanding the fluidics uh, and everything like that. But fortunately, um, you know, Terumo is really invested in developing this technology, so they've, they've been a great partner of ours um, in the past. And I, I believe that some groups have transduced um, not only um, adherent cells, which would theoretically be easier, but also cells that are in suspension. So um, they don't have experience in transducing T cells per se, but I think that given our expertise and our knowledge, as well as theirs, we can certainly find a way to do this. And that's, you know, we're hoping to have this data ready in the next couple of months. Do you see cytokine release syndrome in patients receiving your tumor-associated antigen-specific T cells? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, you just sort of teed this one up for me. So one of the benefits of not using genetically modified T cells is that those T cells are not hyperactivated. They don't have um, uh, artificial signaling domains or exogenous signaling domains. So we do not see the tumor lysis syndrome, or at least we have not yet seen the tumor lysis syndrome. And the majority of our patients have not had any adverse events either. So um, this is a potentially uh, this potential alternative to using the CARs and that we don't see the CRS um, while we do see uh, elimination of the tumor burden. It could be that the tempo of elimination of the tumor burden is slower than the CARs. I think, you know, we still need to evaluate that. Um, but one benefit is the safety profile of these T cells. What do you think needs to happen in order to make these therapies more widespread and how will manufacturing facilities be able to keep up? Yeah, so I mean, that was really the, the basis of my talk, right? Um, right now, I think the reason there's only a, a select number of specialized manufacturing facilities is because you have to have so much knowledge of how not only to manufacture these cells, but how do you submit the IND to the FDA? How do you handle adverse events? 
Um, how do you train the physician scientists to be able to handle the protocol? There's just so much knowledge that needs that you need to have that you really require a large specialized center. Um, but in terms of just the manufacturing itself, uh, which by the way I think is why we need training programs in cell therapy. Um, but in terms of the manufacturing itself, I think what we need are more automated systems. Um, I think the G-Rex, for example, was really transformative for our group as well as Baylor and many others. You know, it, it, it isn't a complex bioreactor that requires electronics. It's, it basically looks like a mushroom. Um, it's, it's a flask, but it has the gas exchange through the bottom instead of the top, so you can basically add as much media and cytokines as you want and don't have to feed nearly as often. Um, and that was transformative because suddenly we can grow hundreds of millions of cells without cell factories or without um, using 10, 24 well plates. So I think we need to simplify the process. I think we need to automate the process um, or at least make it simple enough that other groups can do it. And, and I really think that the virus-specific T cells are a good model. So even if those virus-specific T cells are not put into an automated system, it's so simple that other groups can do it. You just take the PBMCs, mix them with overlapping peptide libraries, give them a couple cytokines, and wait 10 days and harvest them. Of course, the testing of those cells is a bit more complicated, um, but you know, they're, you know, we and others are, are, are more than willing to collaborate and, and help develop those with you. Are there advantages of using your tumor-associated antigen-specific T cells instead of genetically modified cells? Yeah, so one benefit, as I mentioned, was that these cells do not have, um, they have a much better safety profile, at least to date. Um, we've only, we're completing our phase one, so, you know, we haven't reported that data yet, but um, they have a better safety profile at the moment. Uh, another distinction is that they don't just target a single epitope of CD19 like the CARS do. Um, instead, they target three different tumor-associated antigens. So even if there's an immunoscape of one of those, you still have two more antigens that you can target. Um, and we're not targeting a, a single peptide, which is HLA restricted. You know, it allows for the cells themselves to select the best targets, um, depending on the HLA type. So it's not HLA restricted. It targets three different proteins, um, which prevents immune escape, and it has a better safety profile. For a program building a new cell therapy facility, what are some of the biggest obstacles they'll have to overcome? Yeah, I touched on this earlier. Um, it's easier, easier to, to pinpoint what you will need to do in the facility. But one of the challenges and one of the surprises that I had when we started our facility was all of the components that are, are not directly under my control. So um, we needed access to an irradiator, and that was not in our facility. So I had to work with the blood bank. And they've been, they've been a great team player, but that's a relationship that we had to um, make a concerted effort to build. Um, you know, environmental services, so the people who clean your facility, not something you would typically think of, but that's also challenging because, you know, they don't understand the importance of what you're doing. And so we've really made an effort to bring those people under our wing. We have educational sessions for them. We, you know, we order some pizza. We explain to them the importance of what we do. We say, hey, look, there's patients coming from across the country to get our cells, and we're potentially saving their life. And and it's really important, and, and I think they, they've started they've started to buy into that. Um, you know, I, I hear now our EBS director say, you know, Dr. Patrick, you know, I, I think it's it's great. I, I know that we need to clean this better because you know the last thing I want is my kid to die from an infection that they acquired because we didn't clean well enough. And so that to me indicates that we've successfully educated them. Um, so really, it's the ancillary components that are, are really challenging to build. The other thing is you're not like everyone else. So you're not the blood bank. You're not laboratory medicine. Um, you're not hematology. And so you have unique needs. So when, if you're using um, lab medicines, um, um, sterility testing, for example, you know, that's been validated for a blood test. They don't understand why you want to hold it for 14 days if they've already validated it for five. Um, so you know, I, I can give you a whole list of these challenges. Ordering, um, you know, you, you order what you need in a facility like this. We don't have a lot of storage space, and someone else who places the order decides to double it because they don't want to, they don't want to order it um, every week. So, you know, you have to have tight process con control as part of good manufacturing practices, and, and that was an example where we, we realized that we didn't. Um, so, yeah, I think it's more the parts of the facility that 
aren't under your control that are really surprising and unexpected. Well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Hanley for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? No, I think I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to the presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and I think this is a really exciting field to be in right now, and I'm part of, proud to be a part of it. Well, thanks again. I'd like to thank the audience, too, for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank our sponsor, Terumo BCT, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through April 2018. Labroups will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.